Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica and the team, uh, for putting putting up a tireless um, event and all that goes into the background of all of this is just unimaginable with the amount of work you've done. You've done. Chu Nache maybe that. Good morning to the rest of you. And uh, are you all to the Americans of you? I think there's quite a bit of delegation from there. I myself live in Dallas, uh, though I've uh, covered pretty much all of North America for uh, a large part of my career. The, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is at the intersection of blockchain and IoT, and it's grounded in um, a readout of the landscape from my perspective. It's grounded in experiences and a uh, bit uh, implementation that is being done in my ventures and even previously historically it's also grounded in some early work that has been done um, by at least two partnering companies one of which I was a part of uh, which perhaps was the seminal implementation of blockchain on IoT uh, so I pulled a lot of experiences and learning and sharings from that um, and synthesized a few thoughts uh, to you so it's easy to have a conversation about blockchain and IoT and Seoul for a few reasons that you see in front of you. The mayor of Seoul, I understand, um, committed a 50-something million dollar equivalent fund to develop blockchain in the region. Uh, what a vibrant initiative. Um, there are otherwise countries who are banning particular aspects and particular elements related to blockchain and crypto currencies as many of us know that struggle and debate and healthy debate kind of continues. Um, the other is, uh, of course, this is the home of, uh, of uh, an industry paragon that has pushed the envelope of innovation and that is Samsung. Um, and the group president of Samsung or the chairman of Samsung is famously known to say sometime around the beginning of this century, I believe, change everything except for your wife and kids. Uh, and I think that captures the spirit of innovation of this region of the world, uh, especially in times of massive reordering and transformation. And here we are once again at the same game. Um, also, it comes uh, as uh, a nice coincidence and affinity that my early work, in fact, my entry point into the blockchain space was through work that was done uh, with Samsung while I was previously in my IBM role as CTO for North America, Blockchain IoT and, uh, and Cloud Unit. Um, I also wanted to throw this in over here, which is the actual term IoT was um, clearly predates uh, blockchain and was coined around the time when RFID was popularized. And of course, everybody knows RFID over here. Um, and it's uh, entrenchment in supply chains. Um, but keep in mind that we use IoT so pervasively, in some sense it's almost a misnomer by now, um, but it's fine as long as we understand each other. Um, and when it was first coined, the word was, on an average person was texting about five messages annually. So it gives you a perspective of how far along we've come in multiple technologies since then. And the reason I mention and feel close to that as well is because I did some work for Procter & Gamble back then in doing something similar um, in the frontier of RFID as what all of you and me are doing at the frontier of blockchain and uh, crypto tokens. Um, let's get into this. Uh, there are four parts to my discussion. One is, what is the problem? I want to step back up for a moment and discuss what is the problem that we are solving. Not the entire ocean, but I've crystallized about three, four problems. Uh, the other is I want to advance a discussion around what solutions have been uh, implemented, have been conceptualized, have been visualized, have been uh, built, have been reimagined, right? Um, then I'll provide a few proof points uh, that this is not just reimagination and not just concepts, uh, but actual work that has been done and further investments and innovations continue to happen. And I'll wrap up with a call, of, with a call for action in which I need the partnership um, and 
the participation from all of you, all of us in the industry, to move certain gaps and move the needle, to close certain gaps and move the needle, which clearly um, the ecosystem, the small little ecosystem that I'm surrounded in, in my efforts and ventures is not sufficient uh, to solve, uh, to solve um, uh, these gaps. So what is the problem? <clears throat> if you look at the last, take your pick, last 30, 50 years, um, businesses have moved somewhere along this trajectory, and I don't think this is a US-centric rendition, even though my career background is uh, mostly in the US. Um, I think this is pretty much the picture in most, in most economies and geographies. And when we move from conglomerates to corporations to business units and core competencies, Towards the right side of the slide is the inflection point of another technology that we now have come to either love or hate, depending on how you want to, which lens you want to look through, and that is um, the internet, the web, and of course, all the good and the bad things that it has come with. And what that enabled is a reduction of transaction cost, and therefore, companies were able to transact um, remotely um, using a certain technology, and that gave growth to the rise of value webs. Where we are now, 20 years into this platform, meaning from, from, uh, from web-based stack, not TCP IP, TCP IP was much before that. So where we are now, 20 years into this platform, is the, the complexity to manage these value webs is far outweighing the design point and the original benefits that it was designed to deliver, right? So, and that goes back to, not that transactions are not possible, but transactions with trust, as we all very well know, are being challenged on the existing internet. Second problem is that big, deep silos of IoT have been created. These silos are either device-centric or they are OEM-centric, or they are certain function um, centric. So if you look at most smart city paradigms across the world, and you look at technology vendor providers, software platforms to build those smart cities, those architectures look like this picture. And the problem with this is, as might be quite evident to you, the workflow is not, not clear, the economic sustainability is challenged because in many cases, especially in consumer um, areas like smart home, um, you can have a $250 Nest device, but then even after that, even after that, you're still surrendering the privacy of your behavior in the building. Okay? So that's the second problem. The third problem is Actually, an interesting one, when I was looking at it this way, this is the only way I could graphically capture it, um, so bear with me, I'll give you a slight voiceover on this, is that the narrative and the conversation around IoT has shifted a little bit. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but it's interesting to see how it's meandered its way. I've actually worked in IoT, I mentioned the RFID initiative was around 1998, 1999, and then I worked in IoT in the context of smart home uh, with a technology that some of you might know called OSGI, Open Systems Gateway Interface, uh, if, 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 I'm, if I'm correct in, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the abbreviation over there. If you're from a telecom background, you quite likely know about it. <coughs> so the idea was back then to connect devices, just have them connected. And then the conversation moved into make them smart. So instrument them, make them intelligent, um, make them interoperable, right? The three eyes, so if you remember advertisements about IBM's vision around Smarter Planet, which was a pioneering vision when it started around eight, 10 years ago, and then many other companies modeled it, that was the idea of what was smart, a smart home, a smart car, smart health, smart education, so on and so forth. And nowhere in that discussion, nowhere in that stage of narratives, which went on for about 20 years, and by the way, in those two decades, till now, there have been at least four false starts of this concept of smart home, right? I worked on a few of those. So the challenge that we had is that 
not in a good or bad way, there wasn't maturity and readiness to have a viable intrinsic economic discussion in that stack, in those paradigms for smart. Which brings us to the next level, and that is after it became subscriptive, which is what we've seen advanced by the Ubers and the Airbnbs, so and so forth, not necessarily just things, I'm leading up, as many of you can probably foretell, I'm leading up to a discussion around not just things, but a larger discussion around assets, physical as well as digital assets. So subscriptive, moving into shared, and now the tokenization of those assets is kind of the conversation that we are situated over here and in many similar forums of innovation and building. <clears throat> I don't know what lies between tokenization and the future, but I know one thing, at least that's what I aspire for. We want our lives to become simplified and we want technology to help us uh, as, as opposed to us getting enslaved with the technology and the challenges that we are faced with um, in large urban cities like all of you, many of you faced in driving from ancient airport to here. Uh, so how do we use technology, including blockchain and IoT, to make our lives simple? The last problem I want to observe is the following. I'll give you a few seconds to read this. And when you look at these numbers, it's quite counterintuitive. I don't know exactly what the number, the latest number is of where we are going to be in the number of unit devices by 2020 or 2025, but directionally I think we all agree it's a huge number. It's in tens of billions. It's either 20 billion, 30 billion, or 50 billion, whatever it is, is less important, but directionally it's massive of the scale this planet has never seen before, right? Yet at the same time, when you look at the Cisco annual internet report, one of the data points come from there. Only 5% of the internet traffic um, is going to be coming from IoT. Now that's very really counterintuitive given that another metric, not on this slide, might have it later on, is that IoT data growth is six times the data growth of social networks. You think you were busy on your social networks uh, and pumping all sorts of data? IoT growth is six times faster than that. So how do we interpret these numbers? Are the numbers wrong? Are the projections incorrect? Or is there something else underneath of these numbers that are important to us as strategic thinkers, as architects, as developers? And the reason I raise that caution is <clears throat> there are almost as many, is because of this data point. There are almost as many cell phones as there are human beings on this planet. However, the voice traffic on the internet is only 1% of the entire internet traffic. So does that mean we are not talking enough? Of course we are. But I think the point, the point I'm making is that there is something more underneath these numbers that the fact that it's 1% or 5% is less important, but what are the architecture implications? Because the nature of the data is probably very different from the way we expect it to be as, um, as opposed to what these numbers might be misrepresenting. <clears throat> All right, let me move into the solutions that are being advanced. Um, I'll take a slight step sideways. Uh, for those of you who don't particularly come from an IoT background, um, to give you probably two slides. Uh, one is uh, the, we think of IoT as one thing, which it is not. IoT is very distinct based on the kind of sensors, based on the kind of workloads, based on the kind of critical missions, based on the kind of um, and critical missions I've talked in my last slide, you'll see a little bit of those use cases. Based on the longevity of the devices, I'm going to construct the, the solution, the platform for my IoT for solar roofs, which are going to have a longevity of 30 years, uh, very differently from how I'm going to conduct the IoT for a cell phone device, which typically has a life of about 18 months to two years. Um, so IoT is very distinct based on a number of dimensions through how you slice and, uh, slice and dice it. The, the second slide around a deeper anatomy into, into embedded systems, uh, and I do happen to have a background in embedded systems. I led the uh, wireless engineering function for Texas Instruments 
uh, back when uh, 3G was, uh, was poised to take off uh, in, a, in a big way uh, on the terminal side is, is where I worked. Um, so uh, the three modalities of embedded systems um, from left to right, from rudimentary to more sophisticated, um, also time to market ROI associated in, in that order. One is what's called a dongle-based, right? The other is where you have a socket-based semiconductor, a socket-based uh, microcontroller and associated sensors. And the third is where, it is a, where it's embedded into, um, into, into, the, into the core. Uh, so those are three kind of models and there are three examples underneath of it from, um, uh, looks like um, a medical healthcare uh, kind of a monitor and instrument. But here's what is common and fundamental to all three of those modalities regardless. And that is, the function and the behavior of the device depends on the interface between the microcontroller unit, the MCU, and the various um, sensors and transducers, uh, so on and so forth, that are contained in that device. So how do we move the discussion from device-centric silos, which is what I offer to you is kind of the current state of the world, and how do we reorder this into the future that we are visualizing over here at the intersection of blockchain? Um, so if I take the previous picture and drill down into certain use cases, these are rough stacks of three IoT kind of solutions, vending machines, gas pumps, uh, signage, LFDs of the kind that Samsung makes, and parking meters around which uh, blockchain prototypes, by the way, also have been implemented. So the world moved from those individual silos, which were very function-centric, right? And perhaps very microcontroller or OEM-centric, as you see on the left side. And then when cloud came about, everybody moved from the model on the left to the model over here um, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the middle of the slide. And that is, let's extract out, like all good architects, the functions that are common to these vertical capabilities and bring them down into lower infrastructural layers and have the capabilities as vertical slices on top. So this is how smart cities have been built out and many industrial IoT and, um, and perhaps even certain you know, home, smart, smart home kind of capabilities. The inflection point is towards the right side of the picture. And that is we now look at these devices as participants in a peer-to-peer -peer community situated on a decentralized platform. The original experiment that we did, the implementation that we did in, in the work with Samsung uh, in my previous role, well, actually, believe it or not, used Ethereum version 0.5. All right? So uh, it's not important that Ethereum be the platform of choice or discussion over here, but the idea is that every node, every device, to the extent it is resource capable, excuse me, to the extent it is resource capable, becomes a node on a decentralized network and the associated economics and almost like a point of sale. Of course, there's more elaboration that resources um, are, have constraints on certain devices and how do you look at them uh, with, uh, with different choices. Um, there's, there's much larger discussion and I can share experiences uh, on the implementation that we've done in that regard. The proof point to some of these solutions um, I've been talking about this work with Samsung, which is a very, um, uh, given the time I had, uh, it's the only slide I was able to insert over here. But the idea over here is that you have, this is the context of a smart home, that you have a, um, a TV negotiating the usage of electricity depending on my behavior in the home. When I come home, I want to watch TV, and it autonomously negotiates on a decentralized network when it should turn on and when it should turn off because the washer also is connected as a device on that decentralized network. And when I come home to watch TV, I don't want the washer to run, okay? So uh, there, there were other devices also involved in this um, and uh, uh, to, to kind of demonstrate the proof over here. A few other use cases, um, one that uh, in my role at Digital Twin Labs, uh, I've been working with the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that is the tracking of nutrition to certain segments and societies of geography um, for, um, for, uh, for nutritious food. Um, and, and that is particularly to young, uh, young girls, uh, expectant mothers, and lactating women. There are severe challenges in certain parts of the world uh, where they have the disposable income and they spend $3 trillion, mind you, $3 trillion 
in food in that segment of society, it's not that they can't afford it, but it's junk food. It's not nutritious food. Uh, so that's being, um, uh, that's being uh, experimented for the blockchain. Uh, marketplaces, um, we tokenize assets, product effects, recalls, uh, so on and so forth. Many of these use cases, uh, I'm going to skip here in the interest of uh, time, but these are additional use cases, many of which uh, are kind of known to you. Uh, what's my call to action? And then I'll wrap up with, a, with, a, with an animated slide, um, which pulls, I think, most of the discussion together. There are a few requests and challenges that I want um, to offer you um, in, in moving together as a community. Uh, and those actions are in the areas of assets, economics, protocols, and talent. What do I mean by that? By assets, I mean particularly data for a moment. Let me take that as the best description over here. We want to advocate a balance. Right now, the use of data, especially from IoT, is let's try to monetize it without really having an intrinsic model on how to monetize data. The second imbalance is around data is that let's just get in large data from IoT because we can feed it into our AI models and we can get better outcomes. It's a compelling argument. I'm not discounting that. But we need a balance so that the data is also used through an incentivization layer and not just simply monetization, which most of us, at least I don't understand what the monetization model is for a win-win-win in a stakeholder community. The second aspect is economics. And that is um, sensors by definition, have an analog side to them, okay? So keep in mind, we are trying to join the physical world with the digital world. We are trying to join atoms with bits. And sensors don't necessarily follow Moore's law. In fact, over the last 10 years, the average price of sensors has been halved to around 60 cents. Yet at the same time, that price is 40x the price of network bandwidth and 60x the price of processors, right? So it clearly isn't following Moore's law as we typically understand it to be for the rest of the components of the system. So when you're dealing with IoT in blockchain or any other perspective, be very cognizant that you're dealing with the economics related to, um, to, to analog devices. Protocols, we need a lot of work to be done at the protocol level and that is part of the venture work that I've been doing in building a protocol that is specific for IoT devices, if you take autonomous, device, autonomous driving uh, as an example, uh, which is where I'm headed after this event tomorrow um, uh, to, to uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, help them run an, a hackathon for autonomous driving, um, there are multiple additional elements of randomness, like location, um, that, come in, that comes into play in inventing new um, and more efficient protocols. The third one would be a good takeaway for those of you who are looking at skills roadmaps, and that is it involves three, IoT and blockchain involves at least three paths from where people are coming at it. One is from web, the other is from blockchain, and the third, uh, of course, is from embedded system and IoT. My last slide, I'll build it up quickly. I think I've got about five minutes uh, left. <coughs> Um, if we look at this stack, um, by now you can see the punchline, and that is the yellow row, uh, but I'll explain to you what I mean by this, uh, by this build out over here in just a moment. When I was referring to mission critical IoT systems, don't expect those to be running on blockchain. Okay? I'm talking about um, what we call IoT, that concept actually existed before the term was coined before MIT Auto ID Lab uh, coined that term, like air traffic controllers, like nuclear establishments, like dams, so on and so forth. Very proprietary, very real-time kind of behaviors. Don't expect those to change. But here's kind of what that, their stack might look like conceptually. If we, if we go to uh, another view, which is actually very similar to the previous one, so I'll skip this one. Here is a slightly more contemporary, though not futuristic, slightly more contemporary. Perhaps this is how most uh, typical IoT environments exist, and that is you got a topology, either a hierarchical or a mesh network, at the bottom, at the bottom layers, um, and with the dominance of cloud, we have IoT cloud where the devices are sending data for analytics and integration with 
northbound ERP and other legacy systems. Um, that's the apps uh, backend uh, kind of role. Um, the integration became more SOA, API based, and so on and so forth. Um, and the experience was extended uh, through mobile apps and those kind of things. We see those kind of examples in use cases like fleet management and supply chain and so on and so forth. If you look at the next build out, uh, this is an example, a use case of let's say smart farming, uh, if you may. And smart farming indeed has helped poor farmers um, you know, with land rights um, and from market failures in being able to uh, receive credit uh, to run their, their farming. And, and the tie-out is because farming still has a lot of variables to do with weather and productivity and economics associated with that. So the more instrumentation you are able to introduce into that, this is what the stack looks like for something like uh, smart farming. Um, the inflection point that we are working towards uh, in my ventures and quite a few, there isn't enough work going on in, over here that's why also the call to action and the build out of these protocols, and that is how do we create a layer, how do we insert a layer of participation which gives us, um, which gives us an opportunity for device agnostic platform and participation of those devices with an intrinsically um, economic, uh, with, a, with an intrinsic incentive system that is built as part of, uh, those, those, uh, as part of that platform. Um, so we are leading up to a decentralized platform, I call it participation, which includes incentivization, uh, which includes governance and so on and so forth that is commonly associated with, with decentralized uh, ledger uh, technologies. And then on top of that, you can still apply the intelligence of artificial AI for uh, compliance, uh, for predictive uh, uh, maintenance, and the other use cases that everybody is used to. And we have a whole different model of quote unquote monetization, I prefer to call it incentivization, of those devices to participate in this decentralized network as opposed to a previous model which is device centric, which is data and privacy invasive, or which is OEM or domain centric, right? This, pro this provides for a world with more um, uh, incentive as well as better um, user behavior. So I'm, I'm done with, uh, with, my, with my slides. I think we have, according to my watch, uh, another couple of minutes, and I'm glad to take uh, maybe one question, one or two questions. Yes, Han? Okay, let's get a microphone since it is being live streamed, yeah? So this slide seems really interesting, and I, I, I want to ask some detail about that difference between apps in the last side and the previous side? Uh, the difference between the apps. So apps over here, um, I'm referring more to um, uh, really the, the legacy layer. I actually, in the original, in the earlier version of this slide, I didn't call it apps, I called, called it legacy. Uh, but I shouldn't call it legacy because it's giving a projection, you know, uh, historically it's giving you a chronology uh, so anything, so the current apps wouldn't be be be, be legacy. Uh, but really, in the in the first few columns, the apps refer to legacy applications, um, and then of course the apps uh, on the right side of this chronology, <coughs> right side of this chronology. <coughs> excuse me, on the right side of this chronology, refer to um, apps uh, like smart contract apps which would backend um, a, a either a machine-to-machine -machine API um, for IoT's uh, kind of capability, or it would backend any um, you know, mobile app uh, kind of a functionality. So that's the idea of apps over here, legacy on the left side, and more contemporary mobile apps and smart contract kind of adapts on the right side. Answer your question. Anything else? Anybody else? Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure this morning talking to you. Uh, I'm, I'm only too eager to carry the conversation on. Uh, I'll be on a panel later. We might have some opportunity over there. But I'll urge you to please uh, 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 come up and let's uh, spend the next day and a half uh, talking uh, anybody that has uh, an affinity towards this area. Thank you so much.